Today I want to, to draw your attention to the very first phrase in, in the verse. It says, if we confess our sins. Would you say confess with me on three? One, two, three. Confess. Say it one more time, please. Confess. I want to label my thoughts today with these five simple words. Confess your sin to God. If you walk away with anything today, I want you to walk away with those five words. Confess your sin to God. By means of introduction, many of you know I grew up in a Christian home and it's a privilege to have my parents a part of this church. They're on vacation today, but as you pray for them that they'd have a good time resting and relaxing. But I grew up going to church. I tell people I, I grew up on drugs. I was drug to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Every time the doors were open, I was there. I heard the message of the gospel. I grew up in a very conservative Southern Baptist church, so a little bit different than our church here, but very similar. But, but there the pastor stood up and he preached the Word of God. My youth pastor, Brother Dave, and some of the others that came before him, they preached to me the Word of God. Some of the Sunday school teachers, they taught me the Word of God. And, and I, I don't remember who taught me what as a child. But, but I do know remembering, and I remember distinctively all the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament. I remember learning about Daniel and the lion's den. I remember learning about Adam and Eve. I remember learning about Noah and the flood. I remember learning about some of the prophets like Elijah in the Old Testament. I remember learning about the life of Jesus, how he healed the sick, and he raised the dead, and he gave sight to the blind, and he fed multitudes with five loaves of bread and two small fishes. I remember learning all those things, but I'm here to tell you something. I was lost as any other lost person in the world. I was just as lost as the drunkard in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the jailhouse and the crack house and every other house out there as anybody else. I went to church camp for the first time after finishing seventh grade. And every time I went to church camp, I would get on fire for the Lord, although I was not saved. I was on my way to hell. But I would get on fire, and I would develop a, a desire to, to get into God's Word and to hear preaching and to do all those things. But I noticed every time I would go to church camp, I would get on fire for God, and every time I would come back home, I would drift further away from God. I would go back to church camp after eighth grade. I would get a little bit more on fire for God, and, and as I would come back home, I would drift a little bit further away from God. And then in high school, the same way, until after my tenth grade year, things got real. But I want to back up just a few moments when I went into my ninth grade earth science class, my life was impacted tremendously. You see, I grew up believing the Bible and in, in a Christian faith. But that day, as I walked into my earth science class, my faith was rattled and challenged like it's never been before. And my teacher said, I know many of you grew up going to church and you probably believe the Bible. But I want to share with you the possibility of God using evolution to create this world. And instantly, everything that I was raised to believe was questioned in that moment. <clears throat> And then when I walked into my biology class in 10th grade, the, the theory of evolution was not taught as a theory, it was taught as a blatant fact. And I went to Lakeside Baptist Church in Salem and heard a creation science evangelist, a brother Dave and Miss Tabitha took us at the time to go here. And there he began to, to share God's Word and how that, that if the science doesn't line up with the Word of God, don't throw out the Word of God, throw out the science. Amen. And that summer... My family was planning on going on vacation to Myrtle Beach in July 2005. And I was demanded by my father and mother to go. And if you know my dad, you know when he sets his mind to something, it's going to happen. <laughs> and, and I began to talk with my parents and I knew that I needed to go to the church camp. I knew I needed to go. And finally they agreed to let me go. And we were at Emory and Henry College a camp called Super Week. And a guy by the name of Jeremy Kingsley preached that week. And I remember just like it was yesterday. I was sitting in the very back row on that side of the auditorium. I was a back row Baptist, not a front row Pharisee. Uh, don't take offense to that, Brother Dave. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> 
when I was sitting back in the back on Thursday evening, I remember this guy standing up there and he was preaching about Barabbas and Jesus and how, how the Jews, they were, they were demanding that Pilate were to let Barabbas go. And that day, the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God was on me like I've never felt it before. I didn't walk forward. I didn't pray with Brother Dave or Miss Tabitha. I didn't go shake the minister's hand. I knelt down in the very back of that auditorium in my seat, and I literally prayed this prayer. God, please forgive me of my sins. I'm tired of playing church. And instantly that moment, God dramatically changed my life. And that one day at church camp, that one simple commitment to Christ, without that, I wouldn't be standing here today. And I share all that to say this. But there was a day in my life when I confessed to Jesus Christ my sins and He forgave me of my past, present, and future sins. And now my eternal home is heaven. And here in our passage today, we find that, that the writer John is, is writing, and he, he's not writing to non-believers, you need to understand. He's writing to believers, and he says, If we, speaking of himself, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I didn't understand a lot about this verse back then, and I didn't understand a lot about what I'm going to share with you today, but, but when I confess my sin to God that day as a 16-year-old at church camp, all this took place without me understanding it. And so today I want to share with you two simple thoughts from this one verse of Scripture. First of all, when we confess our sins, God will forgive us. Amen. And then secondly, when we confess our sin, God will cleanse us. Will you come with me as we look into this verse? But before we move any further, I want you to, to draw, I want to draw your attention to the first word. Would you say it with me on three? One, two, three. If. Say it again. If. One more time, please. If. It is a conditional word here. Saying that if we confess our sins, if we do this, then God is going to do this. And here he says confess. This term confess, it literally means to acknowledge. And in the context here, it literally means to, to acknowledge that we have missed the mark and that we are consumed and contaminated with sin. We've lied. We've stolen. We've had inappropriate thoughts. We've, we've said inappropriate things. And we've done things that are contrary to God's law. And he says if we confess those sins, then God is going to forgive us. And He's going to cleanse us. So I want to zoom in, not just on those words, but also I want to zoom in on the word forgive today and the word cleanse. And if you mark in your Bible or underline or circle, I want you to just take note of these. Or make a mental note or write it down in your, your pen and pad or put it in your phone there. First thought today is simple but yet profound. When we confess our sin, God will forgive us. When we confess our sin, God will forgive us. You know, I have a very bad problem in my life. And I want to share the problem with you. It's something that I would say many people, in fact, I would say all people, struggle with the same problem. It's called sin. It doesn't matter if you're a child. It doesn't matter if you're in your 20s. And it doesn't matter if you're a senior citizen. At every point in our lives, no matter the age or the stage, we all struggle with sin. We struggle with sin before Christ, and as a Christian, we will struggle with sin until the day we meet Christ face to face. And it's only by the grace of God today that, that all of us are sitting in here and we're not sitting in some prison somewhere. We are saved, we are forgiven, and we experience God's mercy all because of His grace. I don't deserve it, you don't deserve it, but thank God He delivers it to us. 
When we confess our sin, God will forgive us. This word forgive, I want you to understand what this word means. It means to omit, to put away, and to remit. So, so imagine, if you will, uh, many of you have these phones or, or you have a computer out there. Or, or maybe go back to this time where, where you had a chalkboard in your classroom. And, and, you, and, and let's go back to the, to the chalkboard room. You know, when I was in elementary school, we got the dry erase markers in the boards. And they would take the, the erasers and, and they would erase everything that was said. And sometimes you could still see the marks from the pen. And we would have to get a, a squirt bottle and, and clean it off. And, and generally, either the worst behave uh, kid would have to be the one to, to clean it all off. And thankfully, that wasn't me, I, to, to, to your surprise, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> But the same with the chalkboard. But now today we have all this technology, and it's interesting. Today you can go on your internet browser, and you can, you can go on there, and you can click delete history. And it's all wiped away. And here, as we look at this word forgive, it's exactly what it means. Whether you go on your phone, whether you go on your internet, where you go to the, the dry erase board, the chalkboard, and you erase it all, that's what forgive means. It means that our sins have been omitted, they have been put away, and literally they have been forgotten by God. I want to share a few thoughts with you about this term forgiveness. I wrote down this as I read the word faithful in our passage. God's faithfulness is revealed during forgiveness. God's faithfulness is revealed during forgiveness. The word faithful, it literally means trustworthy. It means sure. It means true. Today, as, as, we, as we think about God and His Word, I'm here to just remind you that, that God is trustworthy, that God is true, and that God is sure. And if God was faithful to Abraham by giving him a child later in life, can you imagine being in your 90s and having another child? Well... Talk about faith. God bless them. Amen. God was faithful to Abraham. God was faithful to, to Elijah when he was struggling in his life. God was faithful to Isaiah when he was out preaching to people who didn't want to hear the word. God was faithful to Peter, even though he denied him. God was faithful to Thomas, even though he doubted him. And just as God was faithful to them, God can be faithful to you and me today concerning our sin. God's faithfulness is revealed during forgiveness. Every time that you, you ask God, God, please forgive me of my sin. Maybe you go to God specifically and say, God, please forgive me for, for saying what I said. Or God, please forgive me for this action or deed. God, forgive me. Every time we say, God, forgive me, we are literally declaring God is faithful when it comes to forgiveness. Have you ever noticed in our lives today we want somebody to forgive us when we wrong them. But sometimes it's hard for us to extend forgiveness to somebody who wrongs us. It's hard sometimes. But as we look at our passage today, as we think about Jesus Christ, God is faithful to forgive us no matter what sin we've done against Him. God's faithfulness is revealed during forgiveness. But I also want you to look at the word just in our passage. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. This word just, it literally means innocent and holy. So I wrote down this uh, sub point from underneath. When we confess our sin, God will forgive us. I wrote down this. God's righteousness is revealed during forgiveness. God's righteousness is revealed during forgiveness. As I look at the word just, I'm thinking about how there's only one just man that's ever walked this earth. In fact, Pilate said it himself. <laughs> he said, why, why do you want me to, to kill this man? He is just. This means he is innocent. He is holy. He's done nothing wrong. And as we look back at 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross, He was the innocent, sinless, spotless, selected Lamb of God to pay our penalty of sin. The Bible says in 1 John, and in fact, chapter 2 here, a few verses down, down it says that, that, that He has paid not just for our sins, and He died for not just our sins, but, but also for the sins of the entire world. And so here it is. Jesus Christ paid the penalty of sin, and salvation is extended to all because of Christ being our propitiation or substitute. He was innocent. There he was, condemned to death without breaking a law. And here we are, condemned because we've broken 
the law of God. I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, all I've ever done is told a little white lie. Well, God bless you. I ought to just make you a halo and put it over the top of your head as you walk out of the church today. <laughs> Pray for the rest of us who have horns sometimes that, that f fly up out of our brains and our skulls. <laughs> The Bible says here that no matter, no matter how great we think we are, no matter if we say that, hey, I, I've, I've just only told a little white lie in my life. I'm not a bad person. The Bible says if we offend, you know what that means? That means to break. If we offend the law in one point, we're guilty of all of it. Just as that chandelier right there, if I were to just climb up there and break one link on that chain, you know what will happen. The chandelier will fall and shatter. The Bible says, For all is sin, it comes short of the glory of God. Doesn't matter which link on the chain of sin we break. As soon as we sin against God, we're separated from Him. And His righteousness is revealed. And, and He paid our penalty of sin so that we wouldn't have to die that death eternally that the Bible speaks of, of the lake of fire. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. God's faithfulness is revealed during forgiveness. His righteousness is revealed during forgiveness. But also, I want to share this with you. As we look at the word forgive, it means to omit. It means to put away. It means to, to remit. It, it literally, it means to forget. And so I wrote down this third thought underneath the first thought. God's forgetfulness is revealed during forgiveness. Did you hear me? God's forgetfulness is revealed during forgiveness. So, so here, God forgives us, and then He forgets about it. Just think about it now. God is the omnipotent, all-powerful. He is the omnipresent, all-present, everywhere, at all times, God. And He's also the omniscient God. He knows everything and never has to learn anything. He knows everything in your past and what you're thinking about right now and everything in your future. He knows everything about me and He knows everything about everybody that's ever lived. And God, who knows everything, is willing to take that out of, I say this respectfully, out of His mind and delete it forever. That is powerful. He forgets. <laughs> in Hebrews... We find some marvelous words of the writer of the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 10, you don't need to turn there. In verse number 17, it just listen to me. It says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In the book of, of, of Isaiah, uh, a couple times, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 44, he literally says that he will blot out our transgressions and remember them no more. In Micah, we, we refer to this often, but, but you know, the, the deepest part of the ocean is over 36,000 feet deep. And literally, I, I did a little bit of math, and I think my math is correct. I'm 5 foot 8 inches tall. Not very tall, I understand that. But it would take 6,200 of me standing on top of each other to be the same equivalent of how deep the Mariana Trench is in the ocean. And Micah said that he will cast all our sin and throw them in the bottom of the sea. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 103, verse 12, Brother Bill Musselman used to quote this a lot. He said, For as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our sins. You can't go as far to the west or far to the east or far to the north or far to the south and find your sin when God has forgiven it. You can search all over in his mind. And he's forgiven, but he's also forgotten. So you know what it means to me? Why should I contemplate on things that I've done in the past? Why should I let that just rule my life when God has forgiven it and also forgotten it? The next time the devil reminds you of, his, of your past, just remind him of his future. When we confess our sin, God will forgive us. May God help us to confess our sins to God. Look uh, again in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And now check out the last part of the verse. And to cleanse us from all unrighteous. Say the word cleanse with me on three. One, two, three. Cleanse. One more time, please. Cleanse. When we confess our sin... 
God will cleanse us. That's the second truth I want to reveal to you today. When we confess our sin, God will cleanse us. This word cleanse, it literally means to purge and to purify. I grew up in Franklin County, Virginia. In fact, Boone's Mill, Virginia. And one of the... One of the attributes I like about living in Roanoke is I don't have to deal, deal with iron water anymore. I'm telling you. You could put a nice white shirt in the, in the washing machine and it will come out as brown as this pulpit right here. I'm telling you. It was rough stuff. And here, as we think of water... When I went over, uh, when I went out of town on a mission trip in 2012 to Haiti, one of the things that they told me that I that I should not partake in is drinking the water, the natural water that was there. I had to drink from a bottle. In fact, they said when I went to the hotel to use bottled water to brush my teeth. So there I am trying to use bottled water to brush my teeth. When I got into the shower, listen, I just. I held my breath when I took a shower. I didn't know if it helped any, but I didn't want to swallow any water while I was there. I just said, <laughs> as I was taking a shower. I know, it's weird. I know, I don't, I don't know if it helped at all. But, but anyways, here, here, as we would take water, we put it in a purifier so the water could become purified. So that it could become drinking worthy, if you will. Here, it's the same process when it says cleanse. When it says He is faithful to forgive us, He's also, it says He's faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we confess our sins, God will cleanse us. He'll wipe us, wipe it all away. I'm reminded of what the prophet Isaiah said in the Old Testament. In fact, this is probably my favorite verse in, in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, in verse 18, it says, Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The songwriter said, What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I wrote down this thought. God can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I might have shared this with you before, but I want to share it with you again for emphasis sake. I walked, when I was in Bible college, I was, I was introduced to jail ministry and juvenile detention ministry. And there I would go to juvenile detention centers and I would go to jails and we would have church services for the young people that were there and also for the adults that were there. And we would go in and we would preach. And then when I, when I came over here to Roanoke, God just laid on my heart for a season to go and preach in the jail. And, and, and eventually my schedule got a little too busy and I had to um, make a cut of, of not going there anymore. But anyways, while I was going to Roanoke County Jail, Roanoke County and Salem Jail. I walked in there. I got to the invitation time as I was trying to trying to really emphasize the gospel and the importance of accepting Christ as Savior. And, and one of the men looked at me and he said, Hey, can God forgive any sin? I said, Absolutely. And he looked at me. He didn't say anything. He got his hand up, pointed at his head and said, Can God forgive this? And instantly God began to remind me of some people in the Old Testament who committed murder. And I'm here to remind you that when God forgives us and cleanses us, He wipes it all away. Now obviously, you know, I'm a Baptist and, and I believe in the security of the believer for sure, but, but I want to share with you that, that the Apostle Paul wrote these things. He says, hey, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. No, this doesn't mean that I'm a Christian now so I need to go out. I can go out and I can murder everybody and I can rob every bank and I can do all. No, no, that's not what it means. He says, God forbid that we should continue in sin that grace may abound. God wants us to live righteously and that's why He has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you're here today and you've never been cleansed from your sin. Maybe you're still clothed with your own unrighteousness, which brings me to my next thought I want to share with you. Not only God can cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but I wrote down this, God can clothe us with His righteousness. In 2 Corinthians, we find the Apostle Paul wrote these profound words. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. May I explain that to you? Don't vote me out the church. I'm taking my suit coat off. Okay? <laughs> right here I have a suit coat. A dark blue suit coat. And let's imagine that right now, since I'm not wearing the suit coat, I am consumed with my sin. Right here. And when God looks at me, He sees my sin. 
And if I were to stand before God in this state, I would, He would literally say, Depart from me, I never knew you, into everlasting fire. But since, Jude, since I bowed my knee and confessed with my mouth at church camp in 2005, and I said, Lord, forgive me of my sin, this is what Jesus has done. He has taken His righteousness, and literally, I have just put it on. And so, it's nothing that I've done to get to heaven. It's everything that He's done. And now when He looks at me, He doesn't see all the contaminated sin in my life. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ surrounding me and His righteousness. And I'm here to tell you something today. You're either wearing the garments of sin or the garments of the Savior. Amen. You're either clothed with your own sinfulness or you're clothed with God's sinlessness. God can cleanse us from all unrighteous. God can clothe us with His righteousness, but I also wrote down this side. And, and see here, here as I shared, said just a moment ago, that God doesn't want us to just continue and abide in sin. He wants us to live in holiness. So I wrote down this. God commands us to live in holiness. This is something that's, that's, that's forgotten in the modern church today. The modern church, as Brother Dave talked about on Wednesday, the modern church really doesn't have standards that they've set. And standards are like guardrails. Can you imagine riding along a cliff in, in the, on, on top of a mountain where, where it has just a, a thousand foot drop and not having a guardrail there if you made one wrong error you know what happens you're over and that's what taking the word of God and developing standards do is it helps protect us and, and we hit those guardrails so that we don't fly off into a deep lifestyle of sin and so God is commanding us to live in holiness. And, and I'm here to tell you something today. That God is displeased with the state of the modern church. God is displeased with, with how many Christians today just say, Hey, well, I'm forgiven of God and, and I'm just going to live however I want to live. Well, I'm here to tell you something today. God's Word calls us to holiness. And God expects us to live a righteous lifestyle. Not, not so we can say, hey, look at me, how much holier I am than you, than you a holier than thou. Person. That's not what it is. It's that, hey, when we are saved from the world, we are saved to the Lord. And we want, as a Christian, God says, hey, when we are striving to live in the Word of God, we are seeking to live like Jesus Christ. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, I know, I know what you're saying today. You're saying, well, Brother Brian, I, I've just never sinned like some of these ones in, in the Scriptures before. You know, I think of King David. In fact, you might be thinking of David as a man who slayed the giant of Gath or who played the harp for Saul or who became king. When I think of David, I think of an event in the Old Testament where he was supposed to be in battle and he was looking out from a window and saw a beautiful woman Bathsheba bathing herself and he sent one of his messengers and had her come into his chamber and he committed adultery that day and he sent Bathsheba away and she found out that she was with child and so he summoned her husband Uriah and came in and he had a meeting with Uriah and said, Hey, I want you to take some time off. I want you to spend some time with your family. You know what he was trying to do? He was trying to cover up what he did. And Uriah said, Nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm going I'm to do what I feel called to do and I'm going to continue to be your right-hand man. And David just, I guess he couldn't live with himself with all the burden that was placed on him. So he added more burdens on him. And he sent a message to some of those in charge of the, of the military and said, I want you to take your ride. I want you to put them at the very front line of battle when you go out into war. And you know what that means. When you're in front line, the chances of dying increase dramatically. And so Uriah's out there, and you remember the story? Uriah was dead. And we find King David. You know what? We believe he was probably one of the most spiritual men in the Old Testament. Check it out now. Not just him, but we find that the strong, one of the strongest men physically in the Old Testament was, was you know, Samson. We find that one of the wisest men in the Old Testament was the name of Solomon. And you know what Solomon, David, and Samson struggle with? Sin. And we all struggle with it. In Psalm 51, I close with these thoughts. 
In Psalm 51, we find the prophet comes to David after a little bit of time that he committed adultery and committed murder. And the prophet comes to him and says, Thou art the man. And he said, Thus saith the Lord. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God came upon the King David. And he goes and he says, Have mercy on me in Psalm 51. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Specifically, his sin with Bathsheba. He says, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And he says in verse number 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. If God can forgive David, God can forgive you, and God can forgive me. When I think of David's life, I think of this. Greater men and women of the faith have fallen to sin sting. So I wrote down a closing thought that I want you to take and apply to your life. I've made it a, a, a part of my life. And I want you to make it a part of your life. I wrote in this. I will not let sin control my life. I will confess my sin to God. I will give God control of my life. Three simple sentences. I will not let sin control my life. I will confess my sin to God. I will give God control of my life. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father.